Hey, cross players, Nikki James here. I just wanted to drop in before the episode starts and apologize for the less than stellar audio quality this time around. Uh, some wires were crossed during the setup, and uh, we're still learning and growing. So I still hope you can enjoy the podcast, and we'll be back next Tuesday with a hopefully much better sounding podcast. But for now, let's start the show. Cross players and welcome to episode nine of the Crossplay Podcast. I am Nikki James, sitting here alongside the homie Zach. Hello, everyone. And it's just us today. No Chris. Uh, Chris hates crossplay. Did you know that, Zach? Um, yeah, well known fact. No, he had some um, uh, personal things he had to attend to today, so it's just us. So there's going to be no news. We socked the news in the face, threw it in a ditch. We're going to get right into the meat of the show. We're not going to waste your guys' time. Zach, how do you feel about uh, console exclusivity? Console exclusivity. So I, I, if you're talking just full-on console exclusivity where there's main titles for one console or another, I think we're all kind of in agreement that they serve a purpose. Yeah, um, yeah we're on the same page there. But uh, how do you feel about timed console exclusivity? Now, you mean like with uh, when a game, like for instance a couple years ago, Tomb Raider came out on the Xbox One exclusive and then came out on the PS4 a year later. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Um, okay, so I actually have a lot of thoughts about that. I, I kind of you you briefed me a little bit before the podcast on how you feel about that, and we're actually a little bit on uh, different pages there. Okay, um, I feel like it's bad for the game in overall sales numbers uh, because so for instance, you take Tomb Raider. It came out on the Xbox One, which at the time I didn't own, and it I don't know. I guess it, PS4 players, at least some of them, like me, felt slighted. Like, like we were second class citizens, and that kind of for some of us can can uh, have a result of where we won't buy the game when it comes out on PS4 because it's like, hey, you don't care about me, so I'm not gonna buy your game day one. Like, why so why just out of spite, like hell no, I ain't getting your of, game. Yeah, a little bit, but it's a little petty and it's a little bit out of spite. But um, it's, there's that. There's uh, the fact that after a year, the game's fire has burned out. Um, so it's just the, there's, the hype isn't there anymore. And all the secrets are out. You can go watch a Let's Play of the entire game by this point. Um, so a lot of the excitement dies down. I think it definitely hinders, not hurts, its uh, sales on the other console. And, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, Microsoft, and we're just using Tomb Raider as an example right now, but Microsoft gets, I'm sure, huge kickbacks up front. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Eidos, or whoever made it, gets huge kickbacks from Microsoft for this. Uh, yeah, they would have had to to yeah. to to scorn essentially their their title fucking the PlayStation Four like marquee it's title. One of their marquee, especially you know in '97 and and to like the mid 2000s, Tomb Raider was it for for PlayStation. Um, yeah. But anyways, I I feel like it's bad for the overall like lifetime sales of the product. I feel like Eidos or whoever, I think Crystal Dynamics made it or something. I feel like they're missing out on money in the end. Uh, it's kind of instant gratification. They're getting this money up front for sales they could get on the PlayStation uh, if they released it, you know, day on date with the Xbox. Right. Um, and I feel like it's not good for all the gamers because, you know, an entire, the majority got left out because, you know, PS4 had more hardware out there than Xbox. Yeah, and Tomb Raider had more fans, existing fans on PlayStation than they did on yeah, Xbox. Yeah, because of the pedigree there. And, like, so, yeah, in short, to sum it up, I, I, I think it hurts the game's sales. I think it hurts the game's legacy in the in the end, like, 10 years down the line. I think it hurts the game's overall sales, and I just, it, it kind of scorns gamers. And I don't know. I, I don't doubt there are upsides to it, um, but I don't. I would stop short of calling it good for anyone but Microsoft. Yeah, I but think. What do you think? Uh, well, I think there might be some some uh, short sightedness when they do that, in the sense that they do hurt hurt their fan base. Uh, uh, you know, like essentially hurt their feelings. I mean, I mean, I remember when this game first was announced that it was going to be exclusive on the Xbox. I was in disbelief, and like, I, as a PlayStation owner, I was like, "Fuck this franchise!" Like. That's yeah. like Metal Gear Solid going to Xbox or something like that. Like, yeah, or yeah, Crash it, Bandicoot. Yeah, like I like that. It really irked me. Uh, but a year later, I still ended up getting the game. Um, 
and it's not a bad game, but... Um, oh, you've played it? I've played it, yeah. Oh, shit, give me the rundown. I've only played like an hour of it. I don't know much. It's like kind of open world, a lot of crafting. It's uh, it's almost like a survival type RPG. When I The little bit of it that I played, it really seemed like it took some cues from The Last of Us in terms of crafting and just a really dark tone of it all. There was a dark tone, and it's actually it's one of those games that it's not my favorite style of game. You know me, I hate, you know, laboring through crafting and bullshit like that. Yeah, like, yeah. even the Far Cry games, to me, are a chore to get through. Yeah. So, um, so it's, for you, for a gamer like you, I think you would actually really enjoy the game. And if I were you, I'd give it a shot. But, but I what, totally... about, what about the, the, the topic of, like, the kind of exclusivity? Where, where do you stand there? Where, um, well... I think in the long run, it's it's probably not good. I think they were, um, they're short-sighted in the fact that they wanted some quick cash up front. I mean, there's some benefits. Like, I think it certainly helps the PlayStation edition that came out because it gave them a whole extra year to fix bugs and, and, yeah, that's, and that perfect is it. For sure. That's one of the upsides, but still, because so few people bought it compared to previous uh, editions... It's uh, you know, it's gonna be a forgotten game of the week, like five years from now. You know, <laughs> yeah. On the Crossplay podcast episode six hundred and twelve, we're gonna be uh, <laughs> doing Tomb Raiders on the Xbox One. Can you think of a situation where it's good for everybody? Yeah, I think maybe slightly less time, maybe like three months. Yeah, that's a actually, good. That's a good thought because even if you did it, one, say one month, two months, three months. That's not, I wouldn't feel that scorned, like, at all, as a play, PlayStation owner. I'd yeah. feel like whatever happens sometimes, you know? It'd still be hot when it comes out, and it right. would still right. give them a little extra time. Like, for example, they could have used that on uh, Skyrim or Elder Scrolls uh, 4, Oblivion. That's right. Uh, that game was, um, Skyrim was broken and nearly unplayable on the PlayStation 3. Yeah. And so, I mean, imagine if they made it exclusive for Xbox for like three months and then really perfected on, on the programming for the yeah. PlayStation. Try to release one big patch before that three month extension ends. And, uh, like, yeah, I remember, uh, for Skyrim on the PS3, uh, all the DLC, like Dawn Guard, uh, Hearthstone, and just, I forget the other one, but all the big DLC. Uh, eventually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, listeners, but I don't think it ever came to PlayStation 3, uh, those huge DLCs, because... Uh, some of them did. If, uh, okay, then if they did, it was literally years later, because I remember hearing or reading articles in 2014 and 13 about uh, uh, Hearthstone, whatever it was called, uh, not being released till that year, when it was released like four years earlier on Xbox. Um, so that's kind of a good example of how Maybe a shorter time period, like three to six months, would be better because uh, it, it it doesn't scorn as many people. It gives them time to work on those after release patches, you know, something like that. Yeah. Like, uh, another good situation where that could have worked is uh, Friday the Thirteenth on the yeah. Xbox One. Yeah. On the PlayStation Four, it was not good at release. It didn't run well at release, uh, but it was playable in some way. But however, on the Xbox One, it was completely broken. You couldn't find matches unless they were private matches. Um, and Xbox, within the last, uh, I don't know, two months, finally got a patch where they could now f play freely. And if they would have just waited, maybe there wouldn't be all this negative, you know, ill will towards gun media and the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which there shouldn't be because it's such a good game. I love but... Friday the 13th. That's the thing is a game doesn't have to be good to be fun. It doesn't have to be polished is a better word to be fun. You you for those that don't know, Zach and I live together. We're we're roommates, so you've seen how many hours I've played of Friday the thirteenth. Yes. It's a botched game, but it's so fun. As long as those core concepts are fun, people will keep coming back. Yeah, and if there are glitches and things like that, you learn what they are and you avoid them. Yeah. I mean it's it's simple as that. And so yeah, a game like that is fucking that's a great game and shouldn't get any sort of uh, ill thoughts about it. So that's how, how we feel. If you have any thoughts or comments, go ahead and send us a uh, private message over on Twitter at CrossplayPod. Uh, moving on down the list, this is something that's been on my mind for uh, quite a while here. Um, is, Zach, is there such a thing as true altruism? And what I mean by that, well, let's define altruism. Well, the way I would define altruism is... Um, it's doing something that uh, 
truly benefits another person while having either no effect or a negative effect on yourself. Yeah, where you would, where you know you would truly get nothing out of it. It's like just, jumping on a grenade. Yeah, it's purely for the rea- for for the betterment of others. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so, is there such thing as as true altruism? Um, I think absolutely there is. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so altruism by that definition, um, we see it. You know, like the term "jumping on a grenade." That's something that people actually do in war. I mean, that's something that happens, and that is altruistic. Now, do you, do you really think that, like, say, take the grenade example? Um, a grenade is thrown into a group of soldiers or whatever, and one guy jumps on it. Do you see that as altruistic in the way that that guy thought about what was happening, processed what was happening, no, knew the you know that like he had time to think about it, or was it instinct? It was instinct. So, and so do you would you would you call instinct altruism then? Like yeah, also? yeah. C- uh, altruism it's a it's a funny instinct actually that that exists throughout the animal kingdom. And it's it's mainly because, like, for us as humans, why we have it is is we live in small family groups where we share a lot of the same DNA. And when you think about it ev- evolutionarily, like where you want your your genes to be passed on, if you do something that kills yourself, but but that same act that kills you saves other for people your in your family, life, you know? yeah. then then it's it's a it's a benefit, and and you could see how how natural selection would actually allow for for altruism now, to exist now in doing that like um, dying for your family you know so your bloodline can go on for some whatever reason now isn't that not altruistic because you still get something out of it right so there's still a benefit but the reason why i would still call it altruism is because they don't like you said they don't process that so a guy jumping on the grenade he's not processing it like Oh, my brothers will live on, or, or, um, you know, like, what, whatever personal benefit he get. I think that would be the only thing. Like, if he had his family in the, in the, in there with him in the trench, he's not processing that. He's just acting on instinct. He's yeah. just grenade. I'm gonna jump on it. So yeah, I think that's where we might differ a little bit because I, I kind of separate the two. I separate instinct and altruism. Whereas, um. How do I how do I put this? Like I just, I just feel like instinct is instinct. Like it's not a thought out process, not a conscious decision made. It's instinct, and I feel right. like altruism is a choice. And where I feel like instinct isn't, so that's why I kind of separate them. Um, what, what do you think about that? Am I totally off base? Or? Well, no. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. Like for it to be altruism, they have to know that it's going to hurt them. Yeah, yeah. Or that they get nothing out of it, and know that they get nothing out of it. Um, I, I wouldn't say so because, I mean, when you think about, you know, what's the opposite of altruism, you know, doing something bad to someone else for your own personal benefit. Selfishness, yeah. That's not always a thought out. I mean, 90% of the time it's not a thought out process. Just look at, you know, just watch cops. Um, you know, when people, for example, people who steal, kleptomaniacs, they're not processing it. Oh, this is going to benefit me and hurt this other person if I, they just fucking steal. People who want to go rob a liquor store, they just don't. They don't fuck. They don't think that out. They Clip just go do it. Acts are, are one thing, but I think someone, for instance, robbing a liquor store, robbing like a little old lady, um, I think that's a thought out, conscious effort. Like, where what do I gain out of this? I gain money, and what am I going to do with that money? I'm going to buy drugs or do whatever. Yeah, maybe it's definitely not well thought out because it, it oh, no, yeah, no, like it doesn't usually end up that way. It's more right. like, oh, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a fucking jail sentence. Right. So I don't know. I mean. I guess that's hard. If so, let's just switch it up a little bit to to your definition of altruism. Then, is there any is there uh, true altruism in the definition that altruism is making a conscious decision to harm yourself to benefit others? Um, oh, yeah, not necessarily harm yourself, but you don't gain anything, right? And to to help out others yourself. with with no gain, yeah, or with no thought or no intent of gaining anything. Um, um, maybe to a degree. So I mean, like for example, like being nice to people. Um, you know me, like I'm a pretty nice guy for the most part. I could be a dick sometimes, but um, I'm nice to people and. That benefits me in that it, it kind of makes me happy, you know, like like being nice and kind to people when you have a good positive impact on them, it makes you feel good about yourself. 
Yeah, and that's and why you do it, right? Is that's why you just smile at a guy or whatever. But I think maybe that's not altruistic. You're doing it. You're doing that because you want to feel good about yourself, and you want to maybe make that person feel good about themselves and uh, smile at a stranger. Yeah. Or if you um, or if you compliment like some random person. It's because you feel better doing it, and it's because they it increases the chances of them and other people being nice to you in return. Yeah, well, so, it's still it's still mutual. It's I think it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, being nice to people, there's the personal gain from it, but just as important, like when I'm being nice to someone, it's it's to make them feel better, right. and and them feeling better is what makes me feel better. But that's still. The, the goal is still to make the other person feel better. So it's it's not entirely but self-serving. knowing that them feeling better will make you feel better, does that still not altruistic though, right? Because you're gaining and you're, knowledge of, you're knowingly gaining something. Yeah, I think in maybe. I don't know. Because a lot of times you don't do it. Like, I mean, Cause the reason interactions I'm... with people aren't always thought out. Like conversations, you know me, I put my foot in my mouth all the time. It's just you. You just talk and and you just act and you behave like most of our our actions are on instinct. The only time you plan shit out is like for like serious things. But being altruistic on a daily, just being nice to people, you know, letting someone go in front of you if you're at a four way stop, you know, something like that. I don't, you know, it's sure it makes you feel good, but that's not that's not the intention behind it. It's well, still to the make the other I person up feel the good. Thing, this uh, topic is because. Kind of what I've been saying to you is like, oh, you hold the door open for that guy because unknowingly maybe this and this will happen or you'll feel better. And that's kind of why I brought it up is because I feel like a lot of things people do that they think are altruistic are, are they're getting something in return and they know it. They're just not thinking about it. It's underlying, you know, not false altruism. Like yeah. me, say, uh, I don't know, like say you needed gas money for some reason one day and I was like, here's 20 bucks. Don't worry about it. Get where you're going, dude. That on face value might seem altruistic, but I'm I know deep down that that's gonna it's gonna make you happy, which makes me feel good. It's gonna increase the chance of you helping me out next time I need it, and it is mutually beneficial. But that's not there's a difference between that and altruism. So I think the reason I brought this up is that people know that, and or sorry, people may not know that, but that's what I'm trying to draw attention to is that maybe in these things that we think are altruistic, there's not really altruism in them if we really think about why we're doing it. Yeah, I see your point there. But um, I still think if you, people go out and they just act just for the purpose of helping others without really expecting anything, I think I think there are a lot of situations where people are are kind, but they have motivations of serving themselves. Right. But, but I still think if you if you're not consciously doing it, if you're not doing it for the purpose of getting something good in return, if you're just doing it to make someone feel good. And in the end, you end up getting something good in return. It's still art- altruism because your your main goal, your end goal, isn't to serve yourself. It's to be nice to someone else. Okay, so so you're saying it's more of a matter of intent. Yeah, just, I think yeah. Well, well certainly happens. yeah. I think yeah. If we're if we're talking about making a conscious decision to be altruistic, to be something you know, to be kind, then um, intent totally matters. Absolutely. At that point, but altruism in the sense where that I was saying earlier about just kind of like just altruism in the animal kingdom, right? Um, that is a little bit different. <laughs> that's a that's because there is no intent; it's just instinctual. Yeah, yeah. As far as like uh, altruism within the animal kingdom goes, I think there may I don't think there's any uh, like uh, cross species altruism, uh, but I think definitely within like uh, a pack of elephants. There's altruism all around, you know, to, to help them survive. Um, Absolutely. Like when you see a little baby elephant stuck in a trough and the mom comes and gets it out, like she's not gaining anything from saving that baby elephant. Like, yeah, you know. Uh, anyway, so it kind of seems like we're we have a couple uh, ideological differences on it, but we're about on the same page. Let's see. For the most part. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, we're on the same page, dude. Yeah, we don't got to get in a heated argument today. I'm no, <laughs> no, I'm not in the mood for that. <laughs> uh, so moving on down the list here, uh, anyone that listens to this podcast knows that I am a in- insanely huge Life is Strange uh, fan. Uh, this past Thursday, they released uh, Life is Strange Before the Storm, the sequel, on a PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. Uh, it's out. I got to play a little bit of it. I played about two hours of it. Um, 
I just wanted to, to, to touch on it really quick. Uh, it's it's really good, man. Uh, you haven't seen much of it yet, right? Like, no, I have. You showed me briefly, and then I just I had to avert my eyes because I want to I want to experience it fresh. Right. And play, like in, and in the first through. scene, I guess you could call it like the tutorial chapter. Uh, it's obvious that it's not the same voice actress that played Chloe. Okay. Um, there is a bit of a feel that the game is developed by a different studio. You can tell it's not the exact, it's not Don't Nod Entertainment. It's not them. That bothered me throughout the first scene where you go to see this concert at some, you know, abandoned barn. Uh, but, but when that scene ended and it, it transitions back into like Chloe's home life, it, you're right back in it again. Um, the music is right. The feel is right. The the script is miles better. No, no hellas and wowzers and things like that. Good. <laughs> One clever nod that they did that I really liked was in the options menu when you're increasing like the size of the font or for instance or the volume. It, the size of the font goes from small, medium, large, and then the last one is hella large. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think that's a, a pretty funny nod. That's that funny. Yeah. Uh, I'm really looking forward to playing the rest of the game. Uh, are you, do you plan on playing it? I do, and I, I still I'm still a little traumatized from the last game. <laughs> um, so I did this walk. I did the, a playthrough with with Nick on Life is Strange, the first one, and I I did great. I mean, I saved everyone's lives. Everyone was living, but there's uh there's one girl who Kate. I saved Kate. Kate was okay. the one who was going to commit suicide, right? Yeah, right. Jumping McJumperson? No. Uh, the chick who goes to those uh, parties, the mean bully. Victoria. Victoria. Victoria Chase. So she was annoying to me. like, And so in the game, I just really instigated shit with her. Like, <laughs> yeah, I would, you did. Any chance I got to, to pick on her or do, you know, do something that hurts her, I would do that. Paint spilled on her, and you took a selfie of her. Yep. <laughs> Instead of sympathizing with her. Exactly, and um, it ultimately led to her death, and that kind of like freaked me out. I'm like, fuck! I felt <laughs> I felt personal, personally accountable for yeah. her death, and that's kind of one of the great things about Life is Strange. Is any game that can make you feel like that is is really really a good thing so everyone knows i've played life is strange multiple times I, I ran through it by myself i ran through it with jose i ran through it with zach um just one of my favorite games of all time let alone of 2015 uh so it's out now go get it it's uh 17 for the uh standard edition 25 dollars, i believe for the um limited edition which has one extra chapter where you get to play as Max one more time. Uh, cool. It's got a soundtrack, like a you know custom soundtrack, wallpapers. Uh, Chloe's got custom outfits from the original game that you can use. To be honest, the, the pre-order bonus isn't really worth it aside from that extra chapter. Uh, for super fans like me, I had to have that to be able to play as Max one more time. Um, so, yeah, it's out now. Go get it. Uh, moving on down the list, our grandparents smoked cigarettes like like nothing. <laughs> Because they didn't know the dangers of them. You know, back in the 1910s and 20s, they would even say, doctors recommend Lucky Strike cigarettes or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, quickly within the 30s and 40s onward, it became known how bad cigarettes were. And our, that older generation really screwed themselves unknowingly. What is our generation's tobacco? Like, what is our generation's thing that we're doing now that's going to screw us over later? Okay. All right. Well... I remember the movie, uh, Thank You for Smoking. Do you remember that movie? Yep. It came out like 2006 or something with Aaron Eckhart. Aaron Eckhart, yes. Um, amazing movie. Absolutely hilarious. And um, a little bit eye-opening. And uh, it, it sheds light on, on the big legal battle back in the day between Big Tobacco and uh, the Surgeon General or whoever was suing them for, right. Right. Uh, for all the increased cancer rates. And uh, in that movie, they... Uh, at the end of the movie, they imply what the next tobacco is going to be, actually. and Because what it is, is Aaron Eckhart's a lobbyist for Big Tobacco. That's right, yeah. And then so, essentially, what his next job is, after the Big Tobacco thing fails, he works for cell phone companies and uh, defending them against uh, increased cancer rates be from the radiation from oh, cell phones. Brain tumors and Brain cancer. tumors and stuff right. like that. And... Uh, Maybe that's the next tobacco. I mean, maybe there, maybe there's some truth in that. I know they do studies and they they say that doesn't increase cancer rates, but 
Um, it's also, I mean, cell phones have only been out for so long. We don't, we don't, well, yeah. We can't and also, really... uh, Philip Morris published studies in the eighties that said cigarettes weren't bad for you, you know, and you know, but cigarettes who follow the money trail, like who's behind these, these studies exactly. Um, so it's a lot of science that has to be done, you know? Yeah. Um, but do you think personally that, that, uh, that's going to come on the rise in the future, like, uh, tumors and stuff from, from cell phone use or. I don't know. I mean, uh, it might. Well, I guess we just have to wait and see. I mean, for the time being, I mean, I'm not going to change the way I use my cell phones. You know, I probably sound like a stubborn, stubborn old smoker. Yeah. I'm going to keep hanging on to my marble reds. <laughs> not giving up my Kent filter. <laughs> yeah. That's to prime for my cold, dead, cancerous <laughs> fingers. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not really going to, I'm not going to let it affect me unless right. they have something that comes out where it, like, that really does definitively show yeah, something really cancer. scary. Yeah. Um, but speaking of that movie, one of my favorite lines from that entire movie that kind of shaped a lot of um, my philosophy when it comes to debating is Aaron Eckhart's talking to his son and he's, I think his son is like questioning, like asking him whether he really thinks what he's doing is right. Yeah. Uh, la- lobbying for tobacco companies. And he, he looks at his son and he says something along the lines of, look, if you, know how to argue it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong you're gonna win as long as you know how to debate and defeat someone in a debate you're gonna look like the winner and that always (laughs) rang true with me and i kind of use that in the future whether i was right or wrong in a debate if my debate skills were strong enough to just find this person's weak point or find their mistake and just exploit it over and over to the point where they just admit they're wrong yeah or they don't know how to defend against a straw man argument or something like that um, it really kind of formed the way I debate with people. So I really uh, fondly remember that movie that you bought for me. Yeah. For like my 19th birthday or something. Yeah, because I knew you'd like it. Yeah, you did. and I did. It's one of my favorites. I, I remember one of the – there was a scene where he, he also talking with his son and they were, they were debating something and they were kind of getting a little heated. And the son goes, um, but dad, you know, you know this is what I believe and you know I'm right. Um, you know, how can you say you're winning this argument? And he goes, well, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what they think. And he points uh, to the people that are around in the area. And nice. that, where it's like, you know, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm trying to change people who are watching. So as a yeah. lobbyist, I'm not trying to change, you know, they're not trying to change the scientists' minds. They're just trying to change everyone else watching. Public, yeah. Yep. That's really cool. Um, for me, I feel like... Our generation's tobacco, so to speak, or whatever, is going to be uh, loud earphones. Uh, having earbuds in that are way too loud, it's going to cause extreme hearing loss uh, to our generation in the future, I think. Uh, because, like, uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, you and I, and I was saying when I was a kid, I would put on headphones and just blast the hell out of them as loud as the headphones and as the device would let it go yeah, uh, all the time and not knowing that that was that bad for my ears. And if, and even when I did find out, I didn't give a shit. I, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about listening to my dope music as loud as I can because that's what I like to do. So I feel like there's a lot of people like me that did that and still do it. Um, I don't still do it, but I think there's a lot of people that do. And uh I think it's going to, in about 20 or 30 years, we're going to start seeing a, a huge incline in uh, people going deaf or partially deaf, loss of hearing, etc. Yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, just listening to headphones loud, it's, I cannot do that anymore. Yeah, so and you're saying you never really did that to begin with, right? I, I never really did that to begin with because I've always been kind of touchy about my ears. I remember uh, back when I was uh, playing music, I would practice with my amp all super loud, and if I was practicing with the band, I'd have drums there, and everything's loud, you know, and I wouldn't have earphones in, and eventually, I actually started noticing my hearing d- to decrease. Like, I still, you know me, I, I I don't hear that well. I have to ask people, like, to right. repeat what they said all the time, Right. and um, so I, I could feel my ears, my, my hearing decline uh, just from from playing with my amp too loud and not using headphones or uh, earphones right. or uh, earplugs. Ear plugs, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I never really did that, but a lot of people do. And it's always like, for me, it's just like, I, that's the last thing I want to lose is my hearing. Music yeah. is so important to me. And, and, and just even just talking with people, conversations like it, you have to be able to hear. 
And so, uh, yeah, when I hear people with loud, loud headphones, I I can't help but speak up and tell them something because a lot of times people are just doing that because they want you to hear what music they're listening to. Yeah, so a lot of times it's just people trying to show off. Yeah, know? exactly. Just It's like listening to music loud in your car. It's the same exact thing. You're just trying to show off a little bit. Yeah. And uh, it's just like, dude, it's not worth your hearing. <laughs> You know, yeah, you're if you really that. like that music, you're not going to blast it. Yeah, because you want to hear it in, in 30 years. Moving on down the list here. Um, I want to do a quick forgotten game of the week here. Uh, I'm going to take it over this week, so I'm going to get started. My game of the week is Army Men Sarge's Heroes uh, on the 64, Nintendo 64, PlayStation, and PC. Did you play that game at all? I didn't actually play it. I never had it, but I remember the game when you're little green army men. Yeah, it's a, it's one of the like wave of third party uh, shooters that came out in that era, where uh, companies were making uh, games like like this or uh, Twisted Metal, or I'm trying to think of another Golden Eye. Um, Golden Eye made by Rare. Yeah, so the, these games came out like crazy around this time. This one was made by 3DO. Which was a company, do you remember them? You ever heard of them? Uh, I remember the 3DO system. Right. Yeah, they made the 3DO system. They eventually moved over to making uh, software after that didn't work out. They went defunct in like 2003. Uh, so they, this game was made by 3DO. It was released in uh, North America in September of 1999. And you're, basically, you're Sarge, a Green Army man, and your job is to uh, use portals. Or, you're destroying portals. Your enemy, uh, Plastro, this tan uh, army man, has opened up all these portals between the army men world and the real world. So you go between these portals trying to find them and stop them, and on your way out you destroy the portals. And after you destroy all the portals, you eventually fight him and capture him. There's your story. Uh, okay. So it's cool when you go into these portals that go into the real world. It no game has ever given me a sense of scale like army men did like when you're a, a tiny army man playing in a bathroom and you got to climb over a rubber ducky or you got to jump six feet onto the soap dish it was <laughs> one of the first games that for me really uh expressed a sense of scale where i felt small in a huge world yeah uh, and the the controls were not good um it, it's it's third person it's, it, but it was fun. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier with Friday the 13th. The core concept is fun and people will keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it seems like one of those games that would just really trigger your imagination. I mean, who didn't have army men growing up and set up little battles in your room? You're right, and that's where a lot of those games uh, shine, is, is that if a game can trigger that sense of wonder in you, uh, you'll come back forever because it's just, isn't that why a lot of the people my age still plays because they remember that sense of wonder of playing Mario for the first time or Zelda Ocarina of Time and that's kind of what the dragon that you're chasing the whole time is trying to get that sense of wonder back Yeah, um, and that's very few and far between and Army Men Sarge's Heroes was one of the games that did that for me um, and it's not a lonely game in that franchise. There is 15 Army Men games. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Uh, that I believe Sarge's Heroes was maybe the third or fourth. Uh, and then there was a sequel to that, Sarge's Heroes 2, uh, which came out, I think, uh, 2001, maybe. Uh, but yeah, my, my main memory of this game, where, where it really, where I fondly look back on it, is playing it with my brothers and my dad on the Nintendo 64, which allowed for four players. So the four of us would go into these death matches where the whole point was just to get points. You get a kill, you get a point, the first team to X amount of points wins. And it's just, I don't know, man, it's just old school, just fun, playing with your family, you know, and uh, playing little army men on the video game and, and having fun. My dad enjoyed it, and uh, we did too, so adults and kids alike really loved it. So it's got a lot of... Uh, um, Good nostalgia for me there in that game. So I recommend you guys go pick it up. The controls don't always hold up. The graphics don't really always hold up. But the core concept is fun. It's colorful. It's got a good sense of wonderment. And the single player campaign is actually pretty dang good for a game of its time. So go check it out. Army Men Sarge's Heroes. That is your forgotten game of the week. Uh, does Chris, is it Chris or you next week that's got... Forgotten Game of the Week duties. Chris. Chris. So Chris will be back next week with the Forgotten Game of the Week. Moving on down the list here. Let's talk about our uh, top three games of the year so far. It's kind of the opposite of a forgotten game. and None of these <laughs> games will be forgotten anytime soon. Uh, I'll let you shoot from the hip first. Uh, give me some of your, your three games of the year that you really like. 
Okay. Well, number one game of the year, without question for me, is uh, Resident Evil 7. Damn right it is. That's a great game. What an amazing game. It was just the right amount of spoops. Like, it was a little right. bit scary at times, but it was, it was just scary enough to make you want to finish it. Yeah. And um, I just, you know, you know me, I start games and don't finish them that often. Right. Uh, this was one of those games that I had to get to the end. I absolutely loved it all the way through from the first scene all the way to the end. Yeah, I think you and I played it together um, in about a week or so. Yeah. Of just of like two or three hour play sessions just marching through that game because we liked it. And that's kind of the cool thing about a game like that is for me personally, your game can be as scary as hell, as scary as you want to make it. But the story needs to hold up for me to stick around. Yeah. And that's where Resident Evil usually shines. Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 7 all had amazing stories. Um, so, yeah, I don't, didn't mean to step on your feet there. But, yeah, great game with a great story. No, I, I, it's, is that, I, mean, I imagine that's probably on your list, too. I mean, it it's is, a yeah, great so that's why game. I, I want to save my, what I'm going to say because I'm going to get to it here in a second. Okay. So, uh, Resident Evil 7, hands down, number one. All right. Um, another great game. Uh, Friday the Thirteenth, F thirteen, F thirteen. Just you know, the, another. It's kind of a new game for twenty seventeen. Came out what two months ago? Yeah, about about two three months ago. Yeah, and uh, another game, kind of like Sarge's Heroes, that just kind of captures your imagination. It really is. It's just a game of hide and seek. That's all it is. It's kind of one of those things that everyone has wanted forever. Uh, yeah, more fans have always wanted a legit Friday the Thirteenth game. And even though this isn't story driven, which I don't know how a Friday the Thirteenth game would go story driven, but it's got the AAA treatment. You know, it's gotten the good graphics, full support from develop or from publishers, uh, and it, it's uh, it's hyped right now. You know, and it's even though it's got crazy glitches uh, and problems galore, it's still talked about all the time and still played a lot. It's one of the most streamed games on Twitch right now. The gameplay. Is what I really like. That I, I mean, it could have been anyone. It could have been anyone other than Jason. Just the idea of the game. It's it reminds me so much of hide and go seek, which is like one of the funnest games to play. Right. Yeah. Where you have to go hide. One person's it. He's gonna come try to find you, and it's your job to make it back to the base. Yeah. Uh, if you played it the same way, that's how I did it. Right. And you have to run back to the base. That's J that's the same thing with this game. You go, you try to hide, you try to make an escape. You have to go through a little more steps than yeah. just getting to a base, but still. Game. Yeah. And you know, it's Jason chasing you. If he gets you, basically you're dead. There's a few you know, you could always have a pocket knife yeah, or you could run know, for you a while, outrun him. But usually it's not gonna end in your favor. Yeah. And so it's just it's it's such a good concept for a game that I don't think any other game is done. Um, I can't think of any other game with the same type of gameplay. It's there, so... there is one. There's a game called Dead by Daylight, which may have even come out just before Friday the 13th. Okay. But it's the same one it versus X amount of survivors, and you got to survive the night. Uh, it's They just released a patch for it, uh, a DLC where it's Michael Myers themed. Oh. So Michael Myers in, a, in the, in the uh, Myers house with all these players overnight. Um, wow. So, okay, I, I don't try even that really want to say one is more popular than the other. They're kind of on par with each other in terms of really? popularity and everything. Yeah. Um, but again, Dead by Daylight is also another glitch fest, so it's it's no uh, angel, you know. Yeah, but if the gameplay is there, I mean, uh, like the concept, then it's probably going to be fun. Yeah, i got to try that one. People will play it, yeah. yeah I, I haven't played it myself, but I, I did see the trailer for the Michael Myers DLC, and it really made me want to play it. Oh yeah, that's your that's your favorite guy. Yeah, I love Michael Myers. So um, those are two. What about your third? You got a third? Uh, a third is also a, a brand new one that just came out. Sonic Mania. Fucking Sonic Mania, man! It's just like the old Sonics, only it's better. I mean, it's it's less janky, and it's still challenging, and it still really uh, tests your patience. Yeah, like Sonic sure did. Shit does. You and I spent an hour on the same flying battery zone level, and we couldn't beat it because we get to the boss and game over it hard, you know? Yep. Ah, oh, man. Um, yeah, we got to it with five lives. We yeah. had five lives. We got still to the got boss. a game over. <laughs> we got a game over. Jeez, that was heartbreaking. But the thing about Sonic Mania is uh, it's made from a team that loves Sonic. You know, we're not dealing with Werewolf Sonic. We're not dealing with... 3D Sonic, where he's in love with a human and actually kisses her at the end. 
we're not dealing with these Sonic games that weren't made by anyone who's ever played a Sonic game. It, these, this is a Sonic game made by Sonic fans for Sonic fans, and it uh, they hit every nail on the head. I don't really have a complaint about Sonic Mania at all. Um, for such a cheap uh, and small game, data wise, to be you know this good is is really uh, unheard of. So I'm really stoked on Sonic Mania. Um, so getting to my three, we already kind of talked about most of them. Like I said, uh, Resident Evil 7, I love. Uh, it's definitely on my top three. It's got that Texas Chainsaw Massacre, House of a Thousand Corpses type feel that yeah. I really, really like. Uh, the story is awesome. The scares are there. In, um, you know, And they, one thing I constantly mention when I talk about Resident Evil 7 is how they constantly set up for cheap scares but never deliver them. Uh, which which in turn has the probably the desired effect of ramping up the anticipation this game puts you in a lot of tight spaces where you're going between these two walls and crawling out like this and and you know for a fact that when you get to the end something's going to pop out and scare you that never happens yeah they don't do that so but then what you end up thinking is okay nothing came out nothing scared me that means they're definitely going to fucking get me on the next yeah. one. And then they don't. And it, and it just amplifies and on and on. And just to the point where the game ends in this amazing nightmarish demon fight type thing that just really kind of caps off the whole game. Um, Talk about large scale. That yeah. game really captures large scale. Yeah. And so there's that's my, my two cents on Resident Evil. Um, we just talked about Sonic Mania. I love Sonic Mania. It's my second one. My third one is uh, going to be Horizon Zero Dawn. It is the quintessential AAA game. It's just uh, polished all over the place. It looks gorgeous. The story is in-depth and really good. There's lore to it. It's clear that it's going to be a franchise. Um, uh, probably PlayStation's marquee franchise. Now that Uncharted's about done. Yeah, um, Guerrilla Games, who previously made Killzone, uh, made this game, and that surprised me because I'd never liked any Killzone game. I tried Shadowfall when it came out at launch on the PS4, hated it. Um, so it was a, it was a really sh- a real shock. I didn't anticipate this game at all. So when I I got it from Redbox, it blew me away. Um, probably the the best game this generation uh, on PlayStation for me. Wow. Um, even over Uncharted 4 or any other game. Um, it's, it's a must-have. If you own a PS4, you need to own Horizon. Uh, so that's my top three. Uh, so, yeah, it seems like we're pretty much on par. We both say Resident Evil, Sonic Mania. You threw in Friday the 13th. I threw in um, Horizon. Horizon. Yeah. So, guys... Is there anything? Oh, you know what? I'm gonna, we're about to wrap up the podcast, but I do want to get to a bit of what I guess you could call news. This is something a lot of people have been asking for for a long time. J- the WWE's JBL is leaving the announce desk at SmackDown Live. Uh, Finally. What is your hot take on that? I mean, he needs to go. He's He has a lot of like funny sayings, and he's iconic. Um, he was a great wrestler. But you can't be bullying people on mic, especially someone like Mauro Ronaldo. Yeah. I Dude, mean, he JBL's got Mauro Ronaldo. the announcer Mauro Ronaldo is. Yeah, no one is. Mauro Ronaldo is like the greatest announcer alive right now. Right. They just hired him for the biggest fight of the, of the century with uh, McGregor versus Mayweather. Right. I mean, this guy is great. And then you allowed someone like JBL to bully him off the show. Yeah, just because And you're going to keep him around? Cronies? Yeah. Like, that's, you know, so that's just ridiculous. And so I'm glad this finally happened. Yeah, and JBL released this long tweet about why he's doing it. And, you know, he says it's for so he can spend more time doing charity and all this. I don't care. Uh, I don't buy it, and I don't care. I definitely Um, don't buy it. So who gives a shit? He's gone. That's the important part. Um, His announcing was uh, subpar. Uh, not, Not horrible, but not the best. Um, I'm glad he's gone. I hope they bring in Mauro Ronaldo to replace him. That'd be the ultimate <laughs> fuck you. That would be great. And I don't see why they wouldn't. WWE has always had this obsession with wanting to be associated with real sports and wanting to be associated with combat sports in particular. That's why they bring in the likes of Mike Tyson, Floyd Mayweather, um, Dan Severn, Ken Shamrock, Brock Lesnar. That's why they do these things. Is they like to be closely associated with that. And Bra- uh, Mauro Ronaldo made an enormous impression at the Mayweather fight, uh, just among the sports world. Uh, I remember going on the boxing subreddit the night of the fight, after the fight had ended. The top 10 um, 
comments were all about Mal Ronaldo. Uh, so he's clearly set the world on fire, and he's on contract with WWE right now. So that the fact that he's on WWE's uh, payroll right now, combined with the fact that WWE loves to just associate themselves with real sports, I put two and two together, that tells me that Mal Ronaldo is going to replace JBL. I mean, who else is going to do it? I really hope so. That's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, David Otunga. <laughs> replaces him. Uh, uh, do you have any closing words for the listeners before I close this out, this bad boy? No, just uh, keep listening. We we appreciate all the views that we get and all the listens. Um, we do, guys. And, and um, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to us over uh, at YouTube. Every subscription matters. We see them all. We see every comment. Uh, we really appreciate and love you guys. Uh, if you want to follow us over on Twitter, you can do so over at crossplay pod you can also read the blog at crossplayentertainment.wordpress.com and if you're feeling up to it you can support us over on patreon at, at patreon.com slash crossplay entertainment this has been a really good episode man i feel like it flowed really yeah. well uh did we miss anything either? no i think we we it's touched so on what we wanted to touch on it's so swimmingly it just feels like we missed something guys thank you so much for joining us i've been nikki james i've been zach and we will see you for episode 10 of the Crossplay Podcast next week. Bye.